Hello and welcome to Middle East Matters. This week we'll be bringing you to the smuggling strait that lies between Oman and Iran. Flat screen TVs and high energy drinks all sailing through to markets in Tehran despite international sanctions. Assyrian Christians went on the run last month after the Islamic State group attacked and kidnapped 200 of them. Our reporters catch up with those who have left Syria in the hope of finding safety. And what not to wear on the streets of Amman. Orange has become a controversial colour rejected by all. But first, authorities in Yemen are calling for international intervention as Shiite rebels advance towards the southern town of Aden, where President Abu Rabu Hadi has been taking refuge since Houthis seized the capital last September. Saudi Arabia says it's ready to protect the region. Dangerously close to the edge of civil war. That's how a UN special advisor described the situation in Yemen as Houthi militias square off against loyalist troops. The president has called for Gulf Arab states to intervene. Foreign Minister Riyaz Nister Yassin confirmed on France 24. If the violence continues to escalate and the Houthis carry on seizing territory, we will ask for foreign intervention, even military intervention. A call that Saudi Arabia has responded to with a pledge of support. If the sovereignty of Yemen is threatened, then we will call for the application of Charter 51 of the UN Security Council. The Charter allows interventions for peacekeeping purposes. Thousands of Yemenis took to the streets of Taiz on Sunday to show their opposition to the advance of the Houthi rebels. The fighters now control parts of the city and its airport and are pushing to seize even more territory across Yemen. Taiz is a strategic entry point to the south of the country and there are reports that the rebels are close to the port city of Aden, where President Abed Rabu Mansour Hadi is staying, having fled the capital Sana'a last month. Negotiations on a nuclear deal between Western nations and Iran are within days of a self-imposed deadline. A deal would see Tehran curb its nuclear production in exchange for the lifting of sanctions. Throughout, though, one clandestine route has remained open. A short sale that links Oman to Iran. It's still awash with flat screen TVs, high energy drinks and other items otherwise blocked due to international embargoes. Sylvain Le Petit and Mark Thompson report. Dozens of small speedboats travel back and forth across this stretch of water on a daily basis, some of them almost overflowing with contraband goods. This is the entrance to the Hassab Harbour in northeastern Oman. It's a military zone. Film crews are strictly prohibited from filming here, but one captain has agreed to allow Francois Cat's cameras on board. He takes us to this dock. It's a major hub for smugglers attempting to get their, their produce into Iran. Among their stock, basic home appliances, clothes and medicine. All of this comes from Dubai. It is taken to Hassa before heading to Iran. Under pressure from the US, Iranian merchants have been driven out of the region's key harbors. But those who operate in this creek care little for sanctions. The smugglers are normally young Iranians nicknamed Shooties. Their trips provide business to the bazaars on the other side of the strait, 40 kilometers away. <laughs> As night falls, the Shooties' engines warm up. This is rush hour. The fastest boats can make it to the Persian coast in under 45 minutes. They're responsible for trans... U.S. sanctions have theoretically forbidden financial transactions and therefore trade with Iran. But in practice, trade across the strait falls into a grey area. Omani authorities are turning a blind eye and business is booming. At dawn, police patrol the harbour's entrance. Shooties have to pay a daily entrance fee. This time, authorities quickly spot our camera and request to see our documents. yes. We are eventually escorted out by an Omani soldier. But before that, he agrees to show us what the Shooties take back on their return journey. 
see the Iranian fishing. Yeah, we're coming to Samir from Iran. Now we live in Samir Harbor. After Harbor, going to Samir Car and going to Imara, Imara Dubai. In one direction, they're taking fruits, vegetables, meat, and fish. In the other, anything and everything forbidden in Iran that the West has to offer. These days, there's a big demand for flat screen TVs. Small warehouses have sprung up across the city, with drivers traveling back and forth to prepare orders. Among them, Issa, who works in Hassab two weeks out of every month. Like every other driver, he receives a shopping list. All the orders are phoned in from Iran. Today, Issa is loading up his truck with shoes and energy drinks. They call in, I want Red Bull. 200 like this. 200 like this? Yeah. Okay. Maybe 500. Okay. They send it by speedboat to Iran. Unskilled laborers have come from India and Pakistan. Just like shooties, they're paid on a daily basis. It's calling 20 real like that. 20 real yeah. per day? Yeah, that's okay. all. It's not too much. It's income. not big money. Yeah. Not big money. For us, not big money. But for uh, Dubai and Iran, it's big money. And also this tour. This tour, the people, this is for the people, for local Omani. They rent it for the other people to make it tour. As soon as the shipment's ready, it heads towards the harbor. Until negotiations on Iran's nuclear program reach an end and the embargo is lifted, American sanctions on the country are a goldmine for smugglers. Last month, over 200 Christian Assyrians were taken hostage after the Islamic State group attacked their town in northeastern Syria. Since then, most of the region's 5,000 Assyrians have fled rural areas to the cities, some going further to feel safe and crossing into Lebanon, where all reporters met up with them. Every Sunday, the congregation is a little larger at St. George's Church in the heart of Beirut's Assyrian district. In the last month, more than a thousand Assyrian Christians have taken refuge in Lebanon, which although it closed its frontiers to Syrian refugees, made an exception in this case. Many here have relatives who've been taken hostage by the Islamic State group, but the Assyrian religious authorities have forbidden them from speaking to the press so as not to put their lives in danger. Only a few young people dare to defy this ban. Basha, who arrived six months ago, has even considered returning to defend his village. As a young man, I thought, we need to gather and go back to fight. But we can't do much. We're a minority. There aren't enough of us to fight and liberate our land. This man, who wishes to remain anonymous, fought for two years with the guardians of Habur, an Assyrian militia that was defeated by the jihadist offensive last month. He chose exile when his wife's parents were taken hostage with 200 other villagers. I made my decision the day I learned that her parents had been taken. There was no one left to look after her. She's pregnant and if I die, who will take care of her? Who will help her make ends meet? But even if I wanted to return, I have nowhere to go. The houses were looted, destroyed, burned, the churches were blown up and set alight. How could I go back? Sixteen refugees crammed into a two-room flat. They also have relatives in the hands of the jihadists. The oldest among them feel like they're reliving the traumas suffered by their parents and grandparents before them. In 1915, the Assyrians suffered what some historians considered genocide at the hands of Ottoman troops. In 1933, there were also mass killings by the Iraqi army. They uprooted us, so we fled from Turkey and Iraq to seek refuge in Syria. And then you see what they do to us. They've displaced us once again. We're looking for a safe haven, but we don't know where to go. Some believe they've found this safe haven, but far from the Middle East. This baptism is also something of a farewell for this young father. Even though he hopes to stay and raise his daughter in the region, his parents will set off for Australia in the coming week. Controversial colours on the streets of Amman this week as the orange uniform of street cleaners became tarnished by connotations of prisoners killed by the Islamic State group, a new one was ordered. But it's not just city workers who are rejecting the bright colour. Claire Williams has the details. A matching turquoise overcoat and trousers. This is the new uniform for street cleaners in Jordan's capital, chosen by the public in an online poll. 
All 5,000 cleaners have been told to ditch their orange attire. The colour is now too closely associated with the Islamic State group. We agreed our uniforms should change because they remind people of the Islamic State group, the terrorists. IS group propaganda videos often show hostages dressed in orange jumpsuits, including Jordanian pilot Moat al Kasasbe, who was executed last month. The municipality decided to respond to calls from the family of the martyr Muat al Kasasbe and citizens from across the whole country to change their uniforms. Orange dresses have also fallen out of favor in Iraq's northern Kurdish region. At this textile store, one woman shrieks away from what she now sees as the color of brutality. My heart won't let me wear orange. They put this color on the people they are holding in captivity. So all of us hate this color now. To mark the Kurdish New Year, many women wore brightly colored dresses custom made for the occasion. According to a local vendor, orange was given the snub this year. It's hit business hard here. But in general, people don't like it. Because for them, orange now means blood. The orange jumpsuit has its roots elsewhere, with prisoners at the US run Guantanamo Bay Detention Center. According to US State Department officials, the Islamic State group's choice of color is no coincidence. Well, that brings us to the end of Middle East Matters for this week. Take care and see you again next time.